I believe that words uttered in passion contain a greater living truth than do those words which express thoughts rationally conceived. It is blood that moves the body. Words are not meant to stir the air only. They are capable of moving greater things. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today, I'm going to be talking about Kokoro by Natsume Soseki. I'm really excited to talk about this novel because as some of you may know, sort of uh, in tandem with starting this channel, I also accepted a bit of a personal uh, challenge to a lot of friends and acquaintances who love Haruki Murakami to finally start reading through all of his novels. So I have read them in order now all the way through Sputnik Sweetheart, and I am on the uh, cusp of reading Kafka on the Shore, which I'm really excited about. I've heard a lot of great feedback about this one, and you know, e even just having the word Kafka in the title uh, catches my uh, catches my attention. But anyhow, uh, during the course of these videos and uh, getting comments on them, and one of the charges I get a lot is that I don't understand certain elements of them because I don't understand Japanese culture or uh, Japanese literature which uh, other people have actually argued that uh, Murakami isn't exactly representative of Japanese literature, but much more so Western literature. In any case, uh, it really uh, shone a light on my ignorance, really exposed my ignorance of Japanese literature. So I decided that it would be a good idea to go ahead and start exploring. And uh, as I did some research, a few names came up, Kokoro, by Natsume Soseki was uh, foremost as far as modern Japanese novels is what I've been looking at. Now, listen, I have told myself for a long time that in terms of Japanese literature, I would hit the tale of Genji first by Lady Murasaki and the tale of Haiki. Nonetheless, uh, it's just not happening. In fact, I recall with a bit of jealousy and resentment uh, an essay by Michael Durda, I think in his collection called Browsings, and he talks about how he had wanted to read The Tale of Genji for a very long time, but it's such a sprawling work that, you know, and he, he is a, a critic in uh, the newspaper business, which is uh, even faster paced, and, you know, he doesn't have time to devote to reading that's not being mandated by his employer, uh, you know, unless it's something small like all of these sci-fi novels and so on that he devours. But he talked about how he did have this two-week stint at, I think, either Duke or UNC Chapel Hill. I can't remember exactly which one, but they put him up in a room. He was by himself. He only had to give uh, like some seminars here and there. And so he had a lot of free time and he decided that this was the moment. And he took the tale of Genji with him and he basically just lived in this book for two weeks. I think that's the dream for a lot of us with these big works like this, these, uh, where they're so important, but yet uh, so massive, you know, you need these large chunks of time to devote to them. So I'm still waiting for that sort of uh, divine uh, providential moment to come for Tale of Genji and, uh, and the Tale of, of Haiki. But I do want to go ahead and push forward and acquaint myself with Japanese literature a little better. So I'm looking at Japanese modernity and Japanese uh, novels from uh, Soseki. I'm looking at Yukio Mishima, the sailor who fell from grace with the sea, Snow Country by Yasunari Kawabata, and The Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe. I also got the Penguin Book of Japanese Short Stories, and <laughs> interestingly, or I should say coincidentally, this is introduced by Haruki Murakami. It's uh, The selections are edited by Jay Rubin, the, uh, the famous translator of Murakami's works. Uh, Murakami introduces this by basically saying that he's not very familiar with Japanese literature himself. In fact, the first few pages of the introduction are basically just a, a long uh, apology for not being better equipped. And in fact, he talks about how, 
you know, when he was reading uh, Soseki and, and others, these hallmarks of Japanese literature in school, he just did not care for them at all. He did not care for what is called the I novel, which is a, a very autobiographical novel told in the first person by a single narrator, usually, usually largely autobiographical, or at least dealing with real events. And in fact, Kokoro is an, is an I novel. Uh, and he just said, you know, Soseki and, and I novels and these uh, classics of Japanese literature just never did it for him. And, uh, and he went on to other things. But nonetheless, he starting when he was about 30 or something like that, uh, he decided to start taking Japanese literature a little more seriously and started to acquaint himself. But he, he, he does a little introduction of Soseki as a major figure of Japanese culture and Japanese literature. In fact, uh, Soseki at one point was featured on the 1,000 yen banknote for a while. Here's a picture of it. His career only lasted about 10 years, however, and uh, but during that time, he would create novels that are still considered fantastic representations of the Meiji period. For some reason, my Norton anthology of world literature curiously lacks anything about Natsume uh, Soseki, which I found really weird. It does have Yukio Mishima but uh, not Soseki. So instead, I went and I found this book. It's uh, by Marvin Marcus, a professor. Uh, it's called Japanese Literature from Murasaki to Murakami. And I'm really thankful for this. I mean, it's a very slim little book, um, but it does do a great job breaking down the different literary modes and genres from early, from the earliest Japanese literature and its uh, East Asian roots, and then through the Golden Age, and then through the medieval a tradition and then the bamboo curtain, Tokugawa literature and culture, and then the literature of empire and the complexities of Japanese modernity. And this is where we land with uh, Soseki. And this is the Meiji period. So Emperor Meiji features in Kokoro. And there are, in fact, two pivotal historical moments that are featured and uh, really drive the denouement and the plot arc in Kokoro. And the first is uh, when uh, Emperor Meiji died, and then his general, General Nogi, uh, followed suit. And in fact, General Nogi committed Junshi, which is, uh, you've heard of seppuku as the uh, ritual like disembowelment, and this is an honorable way to die in certain cases. Junshi is basically uh, following one's leader to the grave. Like, my leader is gone, and, and thus so am I. And these two things happened, and they uh, are recounted in uh, not, not the historical representation of them happening, but the event uh, hitting in a in heard of and read in the news in a domestic setting. But this is very significant because the passage of uh, Emperor Meiji in the Meiji era really shows this move away from, you know, Buddhist and Confucian ideals and uh, traditional uh, Japanese culture, and especially again around called the shoguns, and moving out of that into a much more Western-influenced Japan. So suddenly Japan found itself um, wanting to build an empire and engaged in empire building and adopting a very Western educational system and pushing toward um, civ a civilization where people are going to universities and they're learning advanced technologies. So away from manual labor uh, and things like that. And with the out of uh, Emperor Meiji, uh, Edo, as it was called, gets renamed to Tokyo, and modern Japan is basically born. Now, uh, Natsume Sosuki lived through all of this, pretty much, and he's writing about uh, from a very domestic and quotidian perspective. So in the household and within these relationships of a family uh, and friendships, uh, the effects of moving into this modern age. And this will be a theme that is uh, played again and again and again. So where is the contemporary Japanese consciousness to situate itself between these tensions of the old tradition of Japanese culture and the 
influx of Western influence. Again, Kokoro is an I novel, and in fact, it's sort of two I novels in one. The prose is written very, very simply. It's very trim, very sparse. Uh, the translator introduces it and talks about how in Japanese it's very elegant and very profound. Um, but the point is not really the aesthetics of the book, at least not anymore uh, for people who will be reading it now. But the story is very engaging and is very profound because of these different contrasts. In a nutshell, uh, we start off in the first person, I, and we're in a young college student. He's very carefree, very easygoing. He's at the seaside and he, he gets taken by this older gentleman, gentleman whom he will come to call Sensei. As their friendship sort of drums up, it's, it's a study in contrast again the narrator is young, he's in, he's in college, and then eventually goes into university there in Tokyo. He's away from his family, um, so he's in the big city. His family is in the countryside. His father is a manual laborer, and he's sort of like uh, an open circuit or a sponge. He's just taking in everything, and, you know, uh, he's got this energy and this zest for life, really, you know, a blissful ignorance, whereas Sensei uh, is towards the end of his life, you know, and he is, is very pessimistic, very quiet, sort of a brooding character. So it's, it's, it's again, it's just these antipodal forces between the two. But uh, Sensei is, is painted as so enigmatic that we can't help but keep reading. Over time, the friendship between the young narrator and the brooding and really misanthropic sensei uh, start to progress. And then eventually the narrator goes home to his family and finds himself clashing with his father. Now, we have two different father figures, sensei and, and uh, the narrator's father at home in the countryside. And these are contrasts of two different types of leadership which is also sort of the, the microcosmic study of the macrocosm of this historical transition that the Meiji era, era uh, puts into view. And so on the one hand, we've got the, his real father. He masks his emotions and he masks his pain. He's sick. He's uh, probably close to dying, but he doesn't want to lit on. And he just kind of talks about how, you know, I'm just staying in the bed to make your mother feel better, that kind of stuff. Um, but he's this type of person who would work himself to the bone because for him, labor is a vir virtue unto itself. He had, there's a line in there where he says the problem with a university education is that it makes a man argumentative. He starts to see there's this clash. The son is questioning things. And whereas the father's bewildered as to why he's not just accepting of these traditional values they've always had and um, whereas, on the other hand, Sensei is more of the intellectual. He lives in his head. He lives in his mind, whereas the, the older father, um, he lives uh, throughout his, through his body. But the whole time, we're, we're also getting these strange little scenes with Sensei visiting this grave and then getting really weird about not talking about what he's doing or having visitors with him. And we, we learned that there's definitely something that's happened in his past. And I know from, from watching a lot of uh, Japanese movies anyway, that this is a big thing in the Japanese consciousness. It's something uh, that happens in your past that is continuing to manifest itself and fester uh, until it's in some way dealt with. And it's usually something that goes down through the generations as well. But uh, so eventually the narrator is forced to go home to be with his father. His father's getting ready to die, um, but he is writing these telegrams to Sensei and not hearing back. And so it makes him very worried. So with his, do with his dad only having probably a couple of days maybe uh, to live, the narrator gets on, a, gets on a train and goes to Tokyo because he's just compelled. He has to see Sensei and talk with him. And he's just hoping that he gets back in time uh, before his father passes. But this happens while at the same time, he sort of intercepts a very long uh, packet or telegram or letter from Sensei that he doesn't have the time to read uh, on his way out if he's going to make this train and get back, you know, in time for his father. So he takes it with him. 
So the second half of the book, and this is where I say that it's made up of two I novels, we move from the I of the first narrator, the young man, the, the Tokyo University um, student, to the I of Sensei. And he has written this whole letter, and it's a, it's, it's a lengthy portion of the closing of a book, is we get to read this letter just as uh, the, the young student is reading the letter. And throughout the course of it, he confesses basically what it is that he did in his past. And as it's unveiled, uh, it really is very emotionally disruptive and brings out, digs out some profundities of human nature and just what he means by this constant refrain about how there is guilt in loving. And I don't want to give anything away, but the way that it closes, it closes with the letter. The, there's nothing that goes further. There's no narr narrative any further than that. Uh, and it closes in such a way to where uh, now we have witnessed two deaths of characters in the story and the two deaths of the historical Emperor Meiji and his General Nogi. But the fact of the two deaths that we do witness of the characters uh, in the story and the fact of how Sensei sort of puts things into the young narrator's hands is really profound, and it really continues the resonance of the story off of the page. I think we can all relate to this. Very early on, the young student says, I began to walk about the streets discontentedly and to look around my room with a feeling that something was lacking in my life. That's a moment that we all come to face. Um, and so this is also somewhat of a Bildungsroman and uh, where we are uh, starting in the college age and starting to get that gnawing sense that something is missing. What is it? Um, and this is something that I think uh, we have to look between the lines of the story uh, to, to dig out. Being young, I was rather inclined to become blindly devoted to a single cause. This is what I call premature activism. At least, so I must have appeared to Sensei. I considered conversation with Sensei more profitable than lectures at the university. I valued Sensei's opinions more than I did those of my professors. Sensei, who went his solitary way without saying very much, seemed to me to be a greater man than those famous professors who lectured me from their platforms. And, it, and again, this is why I say that he's pre presented, Sensei is presented with enough depth, enough mystery, and enough enigma to where you'll want to continue. It'll, it'll uh, propel you forward and to especially read his testament. Each time I returned, I brought with me a little more of Tokyo. This my father and mother neither liked nor understood. And this is, again, this, this clash between the old values and these new values that are being driven. Because the other historical fact that I learned uh, from Marvin Marcus's work on Japanese literature is that things happen very quickly. In fact, he says uh, that things that took uh, centuries in uh, the Western world took decades uh, in Japan. It, things move very, very quickly. Uh, and eventually from, from that gnawing sense that something is missing, he will, the narrator will say, I felt then the helplessness of man and the vanity of his life which really recalls the koaleth, or the, the teacher from Ecclesiastes. He sees that all is vanity. There is a moment in the middle portion, which is um, the narrator at home with his parents, in between uh, his long narrative of meeting and spending time with Sensei and then Sensei's Testament. There's this one paragraph that suddenly switches to third person. It says, and so while their father was still alive, the two brothers talked of what they would do after his death. But there's no footnote or anything. And, and uh, to give a sense of what the final part, the Testament of Sensei, uh, is like, and this passion and intensity, such as the what I was talking about in the opening quote to this video, he says, right as he's getting ready to divulge the story finally to the young narrator, he says, now I myself am about to cut open my own heart and drench your face with my blood, and I shall be satisfied if... When my heart stops beating, a new life lodges itself in your breast. And this is more profound than simply saying, hey, I'm going to give you this secret. When, when I closed this book, 
I experienced a state of shock and uh, that I didn't think I would for a book that has been said to be just very straightforwardly written, you know, and, uh, and a little older and uh, people uh, in Japan are forced to read in school and don't like. But then, of course, I have to remember the experience that Haruki Murakami is talking about in his preface, preface to the anthology of Japanese short fiction does mirror a lot of what people uh, face with, say, Moby Dick here in America. You know, in school, we're too, we're too young, in my opinion, to take on a text like that. And so we don't learn to appreciate it or how to read it. Um, and some of that's on the teachers, but a lot of it is that we're just too young. And uh, what we really learn is how to hate or shy away from older, older fiction. As Sensei is divulging uh, all this stuff to the young narrator, we get again this clash of the two different cultures that are quickly progressing. He says, you who are used to a more liberal atmosphere must think this strange. Whether we were still under the influence of Confucian teachings or whether we were only being shy, I will leave you to decide for yourself. The story of what it is that happened in Sensei's past, I'll leave for the reader and I won't go into, but it causes him to make this statement that really pierced me. He says, I said to myself at that moment, through cunning, I have won, but as a man, I have lost. A friend of mine who has lived in Japan for the last 15 years or so said that Kokoro is uh, a novel that is very, very Japanese uh, and that it's known by many Japanese uh, this is one of the hallmarks of the modern Japanese novel. I hope you'll check it out if you haven't already, uh, and let me know your thoughts on it. And from here, I look forward to moving on to other works of modern Japanese literature. Please also give me your recommendations. I am a complete uh, amateur in this realm, but I am excited to learn more and more. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day.